Um, so the running order for this afternoon is, is in accordance with the programme. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Dr. Simon Carpenter. He's head of entomology in the Purbright Institute in the UK. And he's going to talk to us about culicoides, biting midges, and blue tongue virus transmission. And what have we learned since 2006? Thank you very much, Sally. Um, so I'm going to talk about midges and blue tongue. Um, I'm an entomologist, as Sally said. Um, entomologists come in two shapes. We all study insects, but some of us tend to kill them, and some of us tend to conserve them. I'm one of the people who kill them. Um, so this is going to be mostly about how we get rid of culicoides rather than how we preserve them. There we go. So I've worked at the Purple Institute for about 13 years. Purple is funded by the um, BBSRC, which funds science in the UK. Um, I'm not specifically funded by DEFRA, but DEFRA also provide a lot of funding for the science that we do as well. Um, Purple is a part of the National Institutes of Bioscience, so we work alongside people like Rothamsted Research, Roslyn, um, <coughs> Babraham, and some of the other centres. Um, we have quite close links with some of these institutes. Most of the institutes have a specific function, um, so there's a reason why the science is done there and not in a university. For the Purple Institute, the main reason is that we work on viral diseases. So our mission is to predict, detect, and control viral diseases of livestock and humans. Up until about maybe five or six years ago, we worked purely on animal viruses. But this has changed, recognising in part the One Health agenda. So we're now starting to work on zoonotics and even viruses which are transmitted purely between humans. Most of those changes have come through um, in the area which I work in, which is vector-borne diseases. So we're now starting to look at diseases such as West Nile virus and some of the viruses which are transmitted from animals to humans. We're also looking at some of the viruses which are transmitted between humans, such as dengue virus, and control measures for those viruses as well. And this recognises that to work on these viruses, you get the best effects by actually combining animal and human health. This is just a quick slide to say a bit about infrastructure. So Purbright has changed a lot in the last few years. So when I first started at Purbright back in 2002, we were already thinking about redesigning the site in terms of the infrastructure. And I'm lucky enough to have survived through to the um, time when we were actually starting to bring this new infrastructure online. So the Plowright building, of which this is a few photos, is the uh, newest high containment facility in Europe. Um, it operates up to CL3 SAPO4 for those who know the acronyms, but basically we work on the most transmissible diseases of livestock, in particular foot and mouth disease virus. And this particular facility is an investment of around £140 million by the public taxpayer in the form of BBSRC. What this gives us the opportunity to do is to work on viruses incredibly safely and under the highest levels of containment. So this is an important fact when you're actually trying to work on viruses spread um, very contagiously. What I'm mostly going to talk about today, though, is blue tongue virus, which is a vector-borne disease. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with some general overview of both the midges themselves that transmit blue tongue and also the virus. I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the virus since 2006, what's actually happened in that time. We've had a slightly more veterinary angle, given the audience. And then I'm going to take a more um, sort of blue sky approach to looking at what science has been done on the insects. So this is biased towards sort of my area, which is entomology, but we'll also be talking a lot about the veterinary stuff. Um, I'm going to run slightly under time because of the fact that I want you guys to have the opportunity to ask questions about more of the veterinary stuff if you want to. So as a vector-borne disease, um, there are certain restrictions on how blue tongue can be transmitted. What we normally have here is a transmission cycle. So here we have a viremic sheep, which is able to be, um, which is infected with blue tongue, and is in, within the period where the midge can come along, bite it, and become infected by it. In biological transmission, which is what happens in blue tongue, the virus has to pass through the midge. So there has to be a, a step whereby the virus replicates and disseminates within the insect. What the virus has to do is to infect the salivary glands. The reason for this is that when the, midge, the fully infected midge takes its next blood meal, it will then be able to transmit the virus. The period um, 
over which that occurs, which is called the extrinsic incubation period, is completely temperature dependent. Midges don't regulate their body temperature like most insects. So most insects cannot regulate what's actually going on inside them in terms of temperature. So if you have a cold day out there, then midges will not be able to transmit blue tongue virus. It's a very simple thing. So usually the limit for blue tongue virus is around 12 degrees. Under 12 degrees, it can't replicate because its viral polymerase shuts down and it can't be transmitted between sheep. So this is one of the key planks on which we build our control measures. Culicoides are odd in that they mostly transmit animal viruses. So there's only one particular virus which is transmitted between humans by midges, and that's called Oropuche virus. It occurs in Brazil and occurs on banana plantations, so not an immediate threat to the UK. Most of the viruses are affecting animals. So what we've got from um, left to right there, we have a sheep with blue tongue, showing a classic um, clinical signs, facial edema and the blue tongue. We have um, a cattle with burnt muzzle syndrome, which is caused, again, by blue tongue infection. We have African horse sickness virus, which is pretty much the most lethal viral disease of horses, can kill up to 95% of animals it affects in certain populations. And we also have epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus. In that case, it's a clinically um, affected deer, a white-tailed deer from America. And over there, where deer farming is actually becoming more and more of a uh, big industry, um, that's now becoming a fairly important disease. Most of today, I'm going to concentrate on blue tongue virus, but ask me about the others if you like. So why are we actually interested in blue tongue virus? Well, since 2006, there's been a whole series of outbreaks of this particular virus, um, and also a related virus, Schmallenberg virus, which is not actually that related in terms of uh, the virus itself, but follows a similar sort of epidemiology. The ones you'll probably have heard of are BTV8. Um, you'll probably also have heard of BTV1, um, if you're from um, Southern Europe in particular. The others tend to get a bit lost because they didn't really lead to major outbreaks. But the point of this slide is the fact that something has changed in the epidemiology. Before 2006, there were none of these in Northern Europe. There had never been a recorded outbreak of blue tongue virus in Northern Europe. Um, and we would have probably seen it had we, seen, had we actually had it. So we feel there's been a step change in the epidemiology of this virus. It's completely changed in the way that it's actually being uh, moved around. So from the top, we had the major outbreak of BTV8, which ran from about 2006 to 2009. We still don't know where that virus came from, so it appeared um, around Maastricht, but we don't actually know the proper uh, place where the index case occurred, and we also don't know what route the virus took to actually get into the country. This had a relatively high clinical impact, so it uh, impacted largely on sheep in terms of mortality, but impact on cattle was actually far more economically important, just through relatively minor, minor clinical disease in the adults, but also fertility problems, abortions, and things along those lines. So that had a relatively high economic impact. It was resolved largely through vaccination, so there were concerted vaccination campaigns um, following on from around 2007, which led to the eradication of the virus across large swathes of Northern Europe. Then we also had BTV1, which moved up through um, Spain into France and then chose, um, came up through um, animal movements and also movement of midges themselves. This seemed to have less clinical impact than uh, BTV8, but was actually very nasty in sheep. Um, again, it was uh, reduced in terms of clinical signs through vaccination, but had a relatively minor um, economic impact in um, comparison to BTV8. We also had some, some surprise visits as well from BTV11 and BTV6. We think these came through um, via illegal vaccine use, largely because when we sequenced those particular strains, they were almost identical to the vaccine strains. So it's possible that someone um, in uh, Northern Europe got hold of the vaccines from OVI in South Africa, um, used them under those conditions. Um, the actual outbreak was relatively minor, so it only went to relatively local populations. There was no clinical impact virtually in the animals which we saw. It was very minor in terms of clinical disease. And the resolution was, was that we ignored them during the winter and they went away. We also have BTV25, or Toggenberg virus, as it was known at the time. Um, this came in in 2008. Um, this, again, we don't know where it came from. 
It was identified in goats which were being moved around, um, so it was part of the um, export testing that they picked it up. Again, it had virtually no clinical impact. We brought it into the laboratory and tried to put it into sheep and cattle and saw absolutely no clinical impact. And the resolution, again, was that this was ignored. We don't know whether that one has gone away or not. It may still be there, causing no particular pathogenicity. We've also had BTV14 come in. Again, this was um, potentially related to a vaccine strain. Um, this, again, had no clinical impact that we could see and, again, was ignored. And then Schmallenberg virus came in in 2011. Um, those of you who were following that story will be aware of that, um, causing abortions in particular, um, and issues um, particularly with deformed um, uh, young. This had a relatively minor clinical impact, although in certain areas it did seem to cause quite a lot of economic damage. Um, it was very specific in terms of that. And the resolution, again, is that a vaccine is available, but as far as I'm aware, the uptake has not been vast for that vaccine. And now, bring us up to what's happening now. We have BTV4, which is currently tracking its way through the Balkans up into Austria. Um, so this is coming around the uh, sort of eastern countries uh, of Europe. And BTV8, which has re-emerged in France. And BTV8 um, in France is what I'm going to talk about a bit more. So this is where we are at the moment. So BTV4 is on the right-hand side in the orange for restriction zones and the clinical cases. BTV8 is in uh, France and in pink on that slide. So we have cases which have re-emerged in France of BTV8. We don't really know where it's come from, again, so the theory goes that it's actually been circulating since 2009 silently in either wildlife or in cattle populations where blue tongue doesn't cause as much clinical disease. Um, and during that time, it hasn't been detected through spreading into sheep populations, but it has been picked up and now it poses a relatively um, high threat to the rest of Europe. The disease um, is still not the north coast, so from a, a purely UK and Ireland perspective, uh, we don't have an issue until it gets there and it's brought over by midges. The winter has also meant a drop in temperature and activity of the midges, but that is now picking up again um, as we get into spring and summer. Um, so we've actually seen a recrudescence of the virus in France. Um, so the chances are we'll be seeing at least some disease by the end of the year in the UK. Just zeroing in on the cases uh, in France, we basically when you actually look at these maps, uh, you'll see that the cases are actually quite spread out and the holdings affected are quite minimal. Um, we don't know how accurate a representation of that is because the surveillance which was done was relatively minor and we're still waiting to see the full extent of this spread. Um, although we know what's happening on the barriers, we, on the um, boundaries of the outbreak, we're not so sure as to the incidence and prevalence actually within the outbreak at the moment. And there's some data which will be coming out relatively soon on that. Um, most of the time where we're actually talking in France, um, the midges which spread the virus are exactly the same species which have been spreading the virus um, in the UK successfully previously. So there's no protection actually from the different species which are present in those two areas. Um, and the virus itself seems to be pretty much the same virus which caused a lot of pathogenicity in herds um, back in 2006 to 2008. So now I'm going to talk you through a bit about what I work on, which is the vectors. So what we have here is a film of the life cycle, which I'm going to show twice, so don't worry if you miss it the first time. Um, so this is the larvae, which live in semi-aquatic conditions, as you can see. Um, so the metamorphos metamorphosis of this particular insect goes egg, larvae, pupae and adult. These are the pupae, um, so these are what the adults emerge from. They rearrange their bodies from a larval form into an adult form and then emerge from the pupae like this and pull themselves out eventually with a bit of a struggle. And what we have here is a male. So if you look at the head end, you can see it's furry antennae. So that's what tells it apart. It's very easy to tell apart from a female, which you'll see in a minute, blood feeding. Um, this is um, thanks to my research assistant who stood very still for a very long period of time to get these uh, films. And you can see that the females fill up with a load of blood um, you'll see the blood in a minute. So he suffers for his art. <laughs> he should run through again in a second. So it's Sinclair Stammers who did this work, did a lot of work for the BBC, um, and is um, amazing at these things because they are tiny. So these are the egg stages again. 
So on farms, you can imagine that the areas where semi-aquatic habitats are available are huge in the UK, not so much in the Mediterranean, where we can target control measures a lot more easily because we know where the wet areas are. So here we go with the larvae again. This sort of wiggling motion is actually quite diagnostic of culicoides. Not much else does that. Still heaving himself out. The um, antennae are actually used to find females. So if you think about it, if you're a one millimetre long insect, finding a mate is not that easy. So they tend to pick up on pheromones quite a lot. Only the females bite. Um, and the blood is actually used to produce their egg batch. So many of the insects can't actually reproduce without taking a blood meal. Okay, so as I've said, most of the areas where midges are breeding are semi-aquatic. So if you think about your typical farm, where you're going to find midges is usually around uh, manure-enrich mud, although not so much in the UK. Um, in the intact uh, dung pats, so we've got a couple of species which actually breed within dung and only breed within dung. We also see them in soil and manure quite a lot, so compost heaps as well are quite commonly used. Um, and what you can see is that the areas which are actually utilised by midges are probably vast on most farms. So they have a huge amount of actual um, habitat to work in. Um, just to um, sort of dispel a myth with this as well, they're not in car tiles and they're not usually in things like silage pits because the conditions are not great for them in those. Um, if you've ever been to Scotland or actually places in Ireland or Northern England and you've been bitten by midges, it's not usually the farm ones which are biting you. So there's a specific species called the Scottish biting midge, which I worked on for my PhD originally, um, which does most of the human biting. Um, midges are actually quite, difficult, uh, quite good at telling the difference between humans and animals. So if you go down to, say, South Africa, you can put out a light trap and catch 1.5 million midges in a night does absolutely nothing to the background population. Um, but you won't get bitten. So these things are really good at telling the difference between different animals in terms of what they're feeding on most of the time. So that's just an example of the vast numbers we can get. So this is, that's a pot which I'm holding up, um, which contains probably around 30,000 Culicordes obsoletus, which is the most common species on our farms. Um, so these things are there in phenomenal numbers. Um, as I've already said, and it's a bit of a bugbear for me, but um, they're not in car tires and open water. You're usually in dung, compost and leaf litter. The catchphrase for this as well, in terms of their size, is if you can see it, it's not usually a midge. Um, so if you're on a farm and you see something on a cow, it's usually not a midge because they are tiny. Um, usually the wingspan is uh, under around three millimetres. So among the um, flies which we work on, they're pretty much the smallest blood feeding flies. For one example to that, uh, one um, contrast to that is if you're up in Scotland, which is where that photo was taken, and you can see the midges actually on my camera trying to bite me when I'm taking a photograph. Um, that's in Punctatus, uh, Scottish biting midge in full cry. Um, and there, if you see it on you, then it probably is a midge. So just to say a bit about how, um, what the point of this is, because if you're thinking about an insect to work on for purely scientific means, midges are rubbish, absolute rubbish. They don't breed in a laboratory. They don't do virtually anything that you would want a model species to do in a laboratory. So our reason for existing is to try and translate some of our knowledge in entomology to policy. First thing which we do quite a lot of is that we know that biting midges can fly a long way. So this is, follows on from a very long piece of work which goes back to the 1970s where we try to predict the incursion of outbreaks of midge-borne diseases through understanding meteorology. Um, over water, so over water bodies, midges can fly for up to six or 700 kilometres. So they're very good at being moved around over water. Um, they don't do it so much over land, so you do still get creep with diseases. You don't get massive jumps, actually, when viruses get into, into the continent or into the UK. Um, what we've done is work with the Met Office um, under a load of um, DEFRA funding to come up with a model um, whereby we can predict this movement. Um, so this relies upon accurate um, weather forecasting and what we do is to uh, release um, particles into a modelling environment 
um, and we've modified um, the conditions under which we think midges can move through a series of experiments which have involved, um, among other wacky things, as flying midges on human hair, which is what you can see right at the top, not one of mine, I hasten to add. Um, we've also got um, sent weather balloons up into the atmosphere to try and figure out um, at what altitude midges fly at, so that can be used to um, change the model as well. And we also work a lot with Rothamsted Research and their long-term insect survey, which is on the right-hand side. So these are 11-metre towers, uh, which are uh, uh, all around the country and monitor aphid populations. So putting all that um, uh, data together, we've actually come up with a model which describes midge movement. And we tend to use that when we know there's viremic animals on the north coast of France or Belgium or Holland. So prediction is quite useful. We've also done quite a lot of modelling which has involved um, Simon Gubbins and Anthony Wilson at Purbright. So they've been looking at whether or not climate influences BTV outbreaks. One of the big questions we had from the 2006 Blue Tongue 8 outbreak was whether or not that was largely due to the fact that it was one of the hottest years on record when the virus came in. So what we did was to examine that and then compare it with the cooler temperatures which were experienced in 2007. And what we find is that although climate modifies transmission of this virus, it doesn't completely restrict it. So the UK's climate and Ireland's climate, for that matter, will not be a protection from outbreaks. The only exception to this is when it gets cold in winter. So when it gets really cold, then blue tongue stops working. And what you can see on that um, slide is a plot of R0, so a basic reproductive number, the probability of the virus actually being able to be transmitted versus um, temperature. And you can see that there's a very defined um, limit under which blue tongue can actually work. We know this as well because the Culicoides adult population also changes. So there was a period over winter when midges uh, are not present as adults. So during that period, that's an extra safety mechanism in terms of not having blue tongue transmission. Um, the slide, the um, picture on the right hand side there shows midge populations taken from one of our traps which we do surveillance for, for um, DEFRA in particular. And what you can see is that most of the populations peak around May, June time and then also in September, October. So outside of those particular periods um, there is a big gap where no transmission actually occurs. In terms of control, so I've already told you that you can go out and catch 1.5 million midges in, um, on a farm. Um, so you can imagine that control is challenging, to say the least. Um, one of the fallacies that um, sort of grew up around 2006 to 2008 was that the poor on insecticides repel midges, which they don't. What they do is cause contact irritancy, so they annoy the midges when they land on them. Proper repellents actually mess with the host location of the insects, so it stops the insect finding its host. Um, so there's a difference there between insecticides and repellents. Um, in terms of the insecticides, um, you're not stopping the insects actually feeding initially, usually. What you're stopping is onwards transmission from that animal. It's a difference that um, it was extremely difficult to get that across both to farmers and to vets around that time. As you can imagine, the usual sort of thing with um, entomological outbreaks, um, everybody reaches for the spray guns, um, but as you can imagine, area spraying, particularly for larvae, is almost a non-starter, in both in terms of contamination of the environment, but also in terms of effect, um, because formulations for these things, you would have to spray a hell of a lot to have any sort of impact whatsoever on populations. We also practice quite a lot of um, stabling, so in the um, original outbreak we looked at stabling quite a lot because it was a useful way of just keeping animals away from, from midges. Um, there were difficulties with this in as much as at least some of the species which we worked with turned out to be endophilic, so they actually quite liked going into stables, they didn't have a massive problem with it. And although that didn't seem to impact massively on overwintering ability in the midges, what it did do was extend the time over which transmission could occur into the vector-free period. So stabling, again, is something that can be useful under certain circumstances, maybe not under others. We know through some experiments which we did that shearing sheep increases blood feeding, so if you take off the um, protective woolen coat, surprisingly enough, you tend to get more blood feeding in those areas, so it makes it a lot easier for the midges to find the sheep. We also know that different breeds vary in attraction of culicoides, so we had some anecdotal information about that, but we also did some experiments looking at 
two different breeds to see whether there are any differences, and we did find some differences in that. Um, these experiments are actually really difficult to do in terms of standardisation, both in terms of how many midges are attracted and how much clinical disease you see in sheep, largely because it all has to be done largely under containment um, for the UK breeds. Um, so it gets expensive very quickly. Um, in terms of habitat modification, we looked at trying to uh, modify things like compost heaps and also dung heaps. Um, so we covered them with uh, tarpaulins and things along those lines. And that had a relatively minor impact on what happened with populations. We didn't see a major impact usually on adult populations emerging. Um, so again, it's something that you can recommend as part of mitigation of transmission, but it's probably not going to knock out a virus which is well established um, in the country. Two things that we do do still, though, um, is protection um, of stock in transport. So if you're moving stock around, we can protect them relatively well in terms of screening, um, in terms of use of insecticides around those particular bits of equipment. Um, we also do quite a lot of work um, trying to improve these methods in the absence of vaccines. So what tends to happen a lot of the time is that it takes time for the vaccines to be deployed um, under certain uh, circumstances, and that makes it challenging then to be able to control the virus in that, in that particular area. So prior to vaccine use is often where we're, we're looking at these techniques, largely because there's nothing else for the farmers to do. So that's the um, very applied bit. What I'm going to talk a bit more about now is global progress in culicoides research. So I've been working in this set field for about 13 years, and things have changed fairly dramatically in the time I, even I've been sort of in the area. So this is more to give you a broader outline of what's happening in vector-borne diseases at the moment, so some of the techniques which are coming online that may be of interest. So. One of the basic things when you're an entomologist is being able to identify your species correctly. So there's a big problem in this, in that taxonomy as a whole is dying on its feet um, in terms of insect um, identification. This is largely because most of the expertise is in people who are retiring. Um, there's not many people coming through who want to do this type of work. Um, but also because we're starting to use molecular techniques to identify insects. So it's much more certain in some scenarios to be able to use a molecular technique than rely on somebody who's looked at midges for 40 years. What we've tried to do is to pair this morphological data, so identifying things using the wing patterns. So you can see a, a nice wing pattern up there on the right-hand side. That's how we generally identify culicoides is by their, their, their wings. And what we try to do is to put these online in open access format. So the idea being that anybody can come along and actually use these techniques. Um, this is in theory, so a lot of the data is still sort of kept by specific individuals, but we're trying to get there in terms of actually deploying this out onto the web. So even people who have a relatively limited understanding of taxonomy can still identify it to a certain degree, at least, the insects they're working on. We've also been implementing multiplex PCRs and sequencing for this role, so we're starting to look at um, sequences of biting midges, um, particularly barcoding them, and trying to get a high level of quality control for that technique, because it's no good um, putting data onto the web which is actually not particularly useful or not particularly reliable. In general, we have massive gaps in our global coverage, as you would expect. So midges are kind of on the borderline in terms of funding in as much as um, you would expect for major human um, vectors of things like malaria, um, dengue, and things along those lines to be much better funded than something for ruminants um, generally. Um, because of the blue tongue outbreaks, though, we've made progress in that area. Um, the global coverage at the moment, we have virtually nothing from the neotropics or Russia or the USA in terms of um, genetic data. We have a lot of good morphological data, but we have virtually nothing on their genetics. And linking that up is actually quite useful in terms of understanding what disease risk is in terms of what particular species can spread what particular strains of virus. There is a general decentralisation of technical expertise, so once upon a time it used to be that there were only one or two centres which worked on blue tongue and, and particularly vector-borne diseases like, um, uh, like this particular one. Um, so that's become a lot more decentralised as a lot of the vets tend to start to have um, uh, things like culicordis research as a second sort of uh, uh, arrow in their um, armoury. 
We're trying to standardise generally what's going on with these techniques, but there is a poor level of quality control. So this is still a challenging area. So a lot of it has come down to individuals actually making sure that they're actually uploading stuff that is actually correct rather than um, erroneous. We've seen an expansion in the range of species. So we work on around 1,500 species of culicoides, of which probably around 1,450 we don't really care very much about because they don't transmit viruses. Um, that tends to be a product of being an entomologist that you work on the stuff that you actually um, has an applied focus. There's major projects going on at the moment in Australasia and Southeast Asia, and we're actually involved in a project in India which we're working at the moment on blue tongue. Out there, blue tongue causes um, issues for subsistence farmers in particular, so it hits pretty much the poorest people the hardest. And we're trying to set up um, sort of surveys of culicoides out there to understand how their transmission is working versus that in Europe and Africa. Some of the gaps that we have is that we don't have a great understanding of the molecular clock of midges, so how long they've been separate for, how long they've had a relationship with blue tongue for. We still don't know, really know when blue tongue went into the USA, for example. We don't have a great in example of that. Um, so questions like that would help in understanding the epidemiology of the virus. Um, and some of them fairly common species, so I've put here the subgenus Avaritia, or these are the ones which are actually quite common um, and act as vectors in Northern Europe. We actually don't know much about um, their phylogenetics or their relationships with each other, which again influences how we understand how viruses are transmitted. Another area which has expanded recently is looking at what midges feed on. So um, one of the things that we can do, if we can find blood-fed midges in the field, we can sequence what's in that blood meal and find out what it's fed on. And this is a really nice technique in terms of understanding which particular species are feeding on ruminants, which are feeding on humans, which are feeding on other mammals. In general, within culicoides, they seem to be able to tell the difference between birds and mammals quite well. So um, certain species tend to um, specialise on avian hosts. Others seem to spe uh, specialise on mammals. Some can also be a bit opportunistic between mammals and humans. So the Scottish biting midge that I've already talked about, that will feed on virtually anything. Um, that will feed on cows, it will come across and feed on you, it will feed on mice, it will feed on birds, it will feed on virtually anything. But generally, there's a certain degree of specialisation. One of the things we've been interested in is how that actually translates to feeding on wildlife. Because if we're thinking about situations like France, where they think that there's been transmission silently, um, that could be going through things like deer um, out in the field. Um, and getting an understanding, actually, of what the midges are feeding on could be a long way to actually understanding that, that issue. One of the problems that we have with these experiments is that what people tend to do is to go out to the field, put up their light trap, which is the standard means of collecting midges, so the midges come in attracted to UV light and then are blown down into a collection tube. Um, what they tend to do is to put those up next to cows. So if you catch a load of midges next to a cow, you won't be entirely surprised to find that it's feeding on the cow. Um, so understanding exactly how to design those experiments has been a big problem, and we're kind of getting towards understanding that now. There is also a question in terms of blood meal analysis with zoonotic transmission. So when Schmallenberg, for example, first came in, most of the risk assessments said it wasn't actually going to be a problem with zoonotics because of the fact that the midges were not feeding on humans. However, bridge species like impunctatus, so if you have an impunctatus feeding on a viremic um, mammal or ruminant and then feeding later on on a human, there is a sort of a transmission risk there. So some of these uh, risk assessments are sort of being thought about in a bit more detail to try and understand what a link is between it. In terms of all the evidence we have so far, Schmallenberg is not zoonotic um, and there are actually no examples of zoonotic diseases that we know about which are transmitted by midges, but in this particular case it was kind of an interesting thought. There's also the question of how these insects are going to res respond to urbanisation. So in a lot of countries, the urban areas are actually getting bigger. So are these insects actually going to be able to colonise those areas? Are they actually going to be able to feed um, in those areas relatively easily? Um, that's another area of research where we're working quite a lot.
Um, one of the things we're also asked about as well is which particular species can transmit viruses. Um, there's been a lot of progress in this area, largely tracking the um, development of molecular diagnostics and in particular the integration of real-time PCR assays into standard diagnostics. So one of the amazing pieces of work was actually done by Bernd Hoffmann actually over in Germany where he was able to process around 24,500 batches of midges for blue tongue virus and come up with which particular species were involved in transmission. So this is a really good illustration. I mean, if you, if you tried to do that a few years ago, then you would not have been able to do it in any way, shape or form without an army of people working on it. So the robo roboticized systems which we now use routinely in our diagnostic laboratories are being translated to insect processing as well. We still don't really have a great idea, though, in a way, what actually happens in the field with blue tongue virus 8 um, in terms of transmission. And we're trying to also look at some cross-factor studies as well. So while what tends to happen with most of these studies is that someone will find virus in an insect, and then that insect will then become a flagship for that virus. We don't tend to look, go back and look to see whether or not, say, mosquitoes are involved or ticks are involved or whatever. Um, it tends to be a high-impact, one-hit type thing. So in a way, going back and looking at some of those earlier studies that may have implicated other species might be of interest. The big thing in this field at the moment is the development of next-generation sequencing, so the ability to go in and look for viruses without the um, sort of preconceived ideas of what's there. Um, this will revolutionise sampling, particularly in endemic areas, where we can go out and look for viruses across disciplines, so not just vector-borne viruses, but other um, forms of transmission as well. Um, and joining up the communities in that particular area is going to be a big challenge, I think, for us in the future. Within the lab, we still bring midges in to do blood feeding and also see whether or not they can transmit the virus under laboratory conditions. Um, this was what I started my postdoc on in um, 2002 in um, Purbright. Um, we've done systematic screening of several species, and we're also trying to find um, modulating factors in infection. So one of those is saliva. So insect saliva can promote the transmission of viruses um, for a number of uh, mechanisms, um, and that's an area which is actually of burgeoning interest, um, in particular in terms of um, vaccine development later on. We're also trying to look at, um, in particular, things like reverse genetics to understand why particular viruses are transmitted by a particular species of insect. Um, so, for example, midges we know don't transmit uh, dengue, for example. Um, why is that? What particular barriers are in place? Is it simply that they can't become infected or is it an epidemiological issue that they don't feed on humans? All of these questions are going to be tractable um, to a much greater degree in the next few years, in part due to the techniques that we have in terms of manipulating viruses and understanding um, the infection process. Finally, we also have um, a transcriptomics and genomics project going on at Perbright at the moment to produce a first full genome of Culicoides sonorensis, which is one of our pet colony insects um, there. And this will be released into the domain pretty much now, actually, it's going on at the moment. Um, the annotation for this is a vast exercise. As you can imagine, it's analogous to things like the Human Genome Project, um, the actual genome itself. Um, is, is a vast thing, so this takes a lot of work from the community to go through and annotate different segments um, to try and understand what the um, phenotype of these particular insects are in terms of their genotype. So this is going to be an area which we're going to be working around quite a lot in the future. The reason why we did the genomics project was that in terms of comparative genomics, um, if you look at the difference between a midge and a mosquito, um, you've got a difference of around 220 million years of evolution. So there's a big contrast there. So if we can contrast between those two insects, then there's a really good opportunity there to do some comparative genomics and understand why particular things are transmitting particular viruses. Um, it may also lead eventually to some of the um, exciting control measures which have been brought in for mosquitoes, including genetic modification for certain species, although we still have a problem in terms of bringing our own species um, in Northern Europe into the laboratory and working on them. We can't actually produce colonies at the moment. So this is a big limitation for future stuff. We're also trying to look at dispersal of these insects as well quite a lot in terms of how their populations differ in terms of their genetics, and this will help that process. 
A key question for me as an entomologist is what proportion of this should be the future funding. So you've got a bit of a tension here between the very applied stuff that I showed you at the beginning of the talk and now this stuff which is getting more and more blue sky. So what proportion should go into each area according to how applied you are? Depends on the funding body but also there is a finite amount of money here. So thinking about that is actually quite important. Finally, just to run through some spatial modelling, so what we've been doing is trying to also model culicoides populations to understand how blue tongue transmission occurs in the field. And a whole range of authors have worked on this um, at a regional, national, local and within farm scale. So right the way from countries such as India, so you can see an ecozonation there where we actually split up India to do the sampling of midge populations, right the way down to within farms. Um, a big problem here with the sampling method is that we tend to use UV light suction traps, um, which are not what actually happens on the animal. Um, it's too expensive and too time consuming to know what's happening on every animal on the farm. So what we tend to do is use light as a proxy and we know there's issues with that. So actually coming up with smells that the culicoides use to actually be attracted to ruminants is one of our big things for the future, um, to try and improve the accuracy of the trapping in particular. We also do temporal modelling in terms of actually how, um, within a season, how that ch and midge populations change. A great example here is in Australia, where they have a blue tongue free zone. Um, each year, Culicoides brevitatus, the main vector of blue tongue, moves up and down um, the um, east coast of Australia, and they monitor this and then move, time their animal movements in uh, relation to that. So it actually saves a hell of a lot of money each year. We had a similar sort of system during the outbreak in 2007 to, uh, 6 to 7, in that we had a transmission free period where we moved animals around during the winter. It's exactly the same technique. Um, so actually understanding how we can implement that and using data, higher data quality will help us actually do that. And then finally, something on dispersal modelling. So we've already seen um, what we did with that. We've also got other groups who are working on movement over land. So this has been a big theme um, for several groups in Europe, actually trying to understand how blue tongue is spread. Um, this has been integrated into transmission modelling, um, but actually getting an all singing, all dancing model that predicts both dispersal and the probability of transmission is still eluding us. So this is something which we'll be working on probably quite a lot, I think, in the next few years. And just to summarise the future directions, we've seen a de decentralisation of technology via Ref Labs and other collaborations. Most of the global studies now have open access resources, so when you're publishing your papers these days, please do put in your basic data. This is what we're going to be doing in the future. You won't be able to get published without that, probably, um, in years to come. There's an increased emphasis on endemic studies in terms of actually understanding how blue tongue is transmitted outside of these expensive epizootic areas. There's a rapid development in sequencing technology and computational power, which is helping us model and also understand the genetic basis of phenotype in these insects, and increased funding for cutting-edge techniques. What we come back to, though, is the funding for basic entomology, which is what I do, which in terms of blood feeding colonisation, which underpins all of these things, knowing which species you're working on, and also understanding what's happening outside of the expensive adult forms that do the transmission. And just to give a big shout out to the JAB Joint Action Campaign Against Blue Tongue, this is going on at the moment, um, funded by the NFU, um, so we're part of this as Perbright, um, and trying to publicise the use of vaccination in particular in the UK. A few resources, have a look at the NFU website if you're interested in the applied stuff, there's some great um, resources there on Blue Tongue. Um, those are just basic reviews that provide sort of a global overview. Um, email me if you can't get hold of them. And some acknowledgements. So I'd like to acknowledge my group, um, VVD programme at Purbright, uh, in particular Peter Merton, Simon Gubbins, Anthony Wilson, and Carrie Batten in the non vesicular Reference Laboratory. And these are my uh, international collaborators. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Simon, for that excellent talk. Um, I'd like to throw the floor open now for questions. If you could uh, wait to take a microphone and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, please. Any questions? Hello. Mario Bellaro from Brazil. Uh, I would like to know more about uh, the vertical transmissions in colicoids by the virus. Sorry, could you repeat that? Okay. Uh, I, would not, I would like to know if you have some new data about the virus, vertical transmissions into the meats in colicoids. Uh, 
So the, the transmission of the virus by the culicoides? Yes. Yeah. The vertical vertical or transmission, or sorry. Yep, yep, okay. So um, traditionally, we've always felt, and there's at least five papers to back it, that transovarial transmission does not occur in culicoides. What, if you go to the literature, so basically the, the insects can't pass the virus from um, being infected into their eggs. Um, if you go to the literature now, there's a couple of papers which are there which have found PCR positives in um, previously uninfected insects. So what they're finding is basically fragments of the virus. So we still feel that's unproven um, because all the experiments we've done previously, and it's not just us, there's at least three groups who have done this, where they've put virus into insects and not been able to recover the eggs, mean that we still feel there's no transoviral transmission going on. The other thing to take into account is that the epidemiology doesn't quite look right for transoviral transmission. It doesn't look like things that go like that. So I think at the moment, the evidence is pretty weak. Is there one more question? Okay, there's one here. Okay. You don't get off that lightly. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Um, uh, my name's Owen Ryan from Ireland. Uh, what do you think the implications are of the change in policy in it with DEFRA? I see now that um, uh, farmers and, and private vets are encouraged to decide themselves if they want to use vaccination, that it's, it's no longer centrally mandated and it's more or less, I suppose, it's up to the, the, the person who bears the risk to decide themselves how they manage that risk. Uh, what do you think the implications are of that for BTV control in, in, I think it's just England and Wales for now? Yeah, so um, this has come up largely because there's been a shift from a sort of centralised um, vaccination campaign to dealing with the virus on the farm at a farm level um, through industry. So the vaccine is available now, pretty much. Um, so what it's going to come down to is an individual economic decision by farmers as to whether or not they're going to vaccinate. They're very reliant upon that for information from their vet vets, basically, in terms of actually understanding what the impact might be. Um, so there is a challenge here in terms of getting the information out and what we're trying to do is to give everybody as much information as possible to be able to make that decision um, in terms of economics for farms. So that is the main challenge with that approach. Um, I mean in terms of the overall thing I think this was, this was inevitable to a certain degree actually. I think this had to happen in terms of bringing it into industry rather than actually the concerted efforts that we've had previously. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have to move on to our next speaker.